All right. Um, today, uh, what we'll talk about again is continuation of uh, conservation momentum. Let's see if I can refresh these. And momentum's useful to us, or conservation momentum's useful to us. Oh, didn't know it was a Kentucky mine. Uh, because it's one of the ways that we can transfer work from one uh, medium to another and have useful work done for us by, by certain things. So the, the genesis of hydroelectric dams is really the mill. Um, the basic idea is you take a river, you put a dam across it, a small dam at a mill, and you impound some water. That water has some head drop between upstream and downstream, and you have to use that in some way. And the way that you typically would have used it is in terms of a, a mill wheel, where you take a linear velocity of something, water squirting out of a hose or water coming out of a, um, a flume, and you use it to actually do work that is in a circular around shaft work. And the utility of shaft work, of course, is that you can use that to uh, power machines like this stamp mill. I'm not sure whether they showed that in this particular case. This would turn this, and the stamp mill would actually um, break things. I guess it's a mining, yeah. So this isn't uh, for grinding corn. It's actually for breaking up uh, uh, ore, I suppose, coming out of a mine, I, I would guess. And so in this particular case, it transfers energy from one kind into another useful form. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and do anything else. I hope this isn't overprinting my voice. I think that's turned off. Uh, we've also looked at work in other forms. The jet lev, I guess, is one of our favorites that we've come back to time after time. And again, we're taking, in this case, uh, stored strain energy in a pump that's being pumped along a tube and out to be able to allow us to have this little handy-dandy $150,000 toy, which is really based on exchange of momentum. The same as you could imagine this is kicking out a whole bunch of uh, racquetball balls or tennis balls that have mass and it's exactly the same process it's just that water happens to be a, a convenient medium to to work through these machines and we've we've looked at that in the past um, I guess we've also looked at this so maybe we'll get to this or not uh, uh, if you work in a lab you should be aware of the dangers of I guess of uh, the so-called sleeping giants been around for 99. But could a ruptured tank really burrow through a brick wall? Into the next county. Here we go, shearing the regulator off the tank. Attempt number two. In five, four, cross your fingers, three, two, two, one. is a lovely, lovely sound. The valve has sheared clean off, and that's a very good sign. It looks like the cylinder flew straight and true, but did it have enough thrust to crack the wall? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it was the lard that did it. <laughs> <laughs> At 40 miles per hour, the air tank turned the cinder block to cinders. It even put a fair dent in the wall six feet behind it. It totally. No I mean, it didn't go all the way through, but it uh, it went through this one and it was gone. It's working its way through that one. I, I was ready to I was ready to see this yeah. as not possible. So I was totally expecting it not to actually work because it's one of those apocryphal tales, and everyone we talked to had heard the story, but no one knew anybody that it happened to. You know, this was an optimum situation for this tank. Uh, what this tank did is as good as it gets. All right. My so. favorite thing is just the perfect roundness of the top of this hole. It also pushed this entire wall back a half an inch. Although the cylinder Oops, actually they're gonna show you was deliberately yeah. aimed, you couldn't ask for a more convincing result. So let's call this myth totally and spectacularly confirmed. 
There we go. All right. I press All right. So let me get rid of the sound on that as well so it's not playing in the background. Anyway, so that's our aim, if you like. We're going to try and demonstrate the, the mechanisms by, by which that works. And so the theory behind it, if you like, I guess you've already seen a little bit of this, is that uh, we said that we would be looking at three conservation uh, mechanisms. One was conservation of mass, we dealt with last week. One is conservation of momentum, we looked at this, looking at this week. And uh, next week is conservation of energy. So you remember we had this uh, relationship called Reynolds Transport Theorem. We had uh, extensive and intensive quantities that we could substitute into this. But the bottom line was, and I'm not sure, was that in terms of the time rate of change part, we're always going to assume that this is zero in the problems that we'll deal with. And if that's the case, then this comes out to be, as you'll remember, this is a mass rate of change, a scalar, and this is a velocity. And because this derivative here is basically uh, mass times a rate of change of velocity, this is mass times acceleration, then this ends up being a sum of forces. So the important thing, I guess, in this, and we'll talk about the, um, the sign conventions, is that this is a vector, this is a scalar, and this is a vector. And so if we write it out in maybe an easier shorthand for us to mess around with, then it's really the sum of the velocities times mass flow rates is equal to the sum of the forces that is acting on something. Right? And if we want to write that out in longhand, then this is a velocity in x, a velocity in y, and a velocity in z, multiplied by mass flow rates. And it has to be equal to forces in x, forces in y, and forces in z. So that's so this complex formula that we have from Reynolds transport theorem ends up basically being that. And so typically what we're trying to do is resolve in one direction. And if we're resolving in one direction, then we'll choose one direction, which might be x or y or z, and choose the components that relate to that and sum those components. And so I guess it's probably worthwhile mentioning the, the sign convention or just reiterating the sign convention. The sign convention is that mass flow rates are positive if out of the control volume. They're negative if in because of this dot product, right? We've said that if it's the, 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 the norm, outward normal to the body, it always points out. If the flow is in exactly the same direction as that outward normal, then they're aligned and the dot product is plus one, and therefore it's positive. And so this comes out of this. But... Importantly, the magnitudes of velocity are always positive in the global direction. So this is all. You, that's those are the two things you absolutely have to remember: is that this is a scalar, and then hence it's just a single value, but it's always positive if going out of the control volume, negative if going in. Velocities and the directions of forces are always prescribed positive in the global directions, okay? So, so maybe to um, establish that, um, I guess actually, I don't know. I'm not sure what a, a, a good example, well, actually let's do a good, I was gonna do something in a slightly different way. I was gonna do some examples uh, that are in the notes, but let's do the, uh, the jetpack, jetpack example. And so the jetpack example is uh, a guy or a gal that's sitting on this thing that has some weight, and on the back there's some stream of fluid that's coming out at some velocity v2. You could imagine that there's some 
fluid that's going in here at some velocity v1 and some cross-sectional area a1 and a2 for each of these. And so then the question becomes how do we, well, what, what, what's the question that you might want to ask? Well, no. How fast? To lift someone. And so that's the question we're trying to answer. So let's take our, our geometry and let's put a control volume around it. And that's this dotted line. And we could probably make that a bit simpler by just taking this volume here and treating it only as this. So this is exactly the same as we had before. We have the weight. We have V1 and A1. We have V2 and A2. And we, this is purely the question we want to ask. ask. We want to know what is either V1 or V2. It doesn't really matter which one. If we have one, we have the other. We put a control volume around it, which is this dotted line. And we can uh, resolve vertically. We'll choose our coordinate system, x, y, and z. Remember, we all said right-hand rule, always with z vertically upwards. And if I just scoot down here, so we have this. This is exactly what we're going to use. The most important thing you could imagine this is that we want to, we could resolve horizontally. Um, and actually, if we resolve horizontally, horizontally, you can do it. For, you'd probably find that you have no forces in the horizontal plane. But So let's resolve vertically. So we're going to use this. And we're going to use this. So we want to use the fact that velocity in the z direction multiplied by the mass flow rate has to equal force in the z direction. This is just a, a single expression now. What are the forces that we have acting? I guess we also have a force which would be P2 here. And we could also have, imagine we have a pressure P1 here, the fluid pressure, just to be complete. So let's work with this. What, uh, if we resolve vertically, what uh, velocities do we have in the vertical direction? We have a velocity V2 multiplied by a mass flow rate, which would be a density, an area, and a velocity. This flow rate is out, and so this has to be positive by what we said about our mass flow rate. This velocity is in the negative z direction, so this has to be negative. Uh, and we have to accommodate that with the forces that we'd have applied on this. So what are the forces? We have a weight, which is a... Uh, Siri, what do you need to know? <laughs> So we have a mass, which would be a mass of, of a person, times g. That's the force. It's acting downwards. So in that orientation, it's negative. And we have, you could imagine, a fluid pressure that's acting up here, which has magnitude p2, not a velocity, but a fluid pressure p2 which is acting on here, acting upwards, which is P2A2. 
we use the same arguments as we used before, bless you, um, that fluids at a point have to be uh, equal pressure in all directions. If it's atmospheric acting out here, then by the same token, it's atmospheric acting out here. And as a result of this, we merely have the calculation. We can rearrange it. What, what is this? This is going to be minus V2 squared rho <coughs> A2 is equal to minus mass times G. This is the term we want. They're both negative, so we don't really care. So we end up with V2 squared is equal to mass times gravity over density of water times the area of the outlet orifice. And if we square root both sides, we end up with simple expression. So we end up being able to say that the velocity that we need is just going to be equal to the mass of the person, gravity, density, and the cross-sectional area of flow. That's it. And so immediately now, if we know what that velocity is, um, we could size a pump to be able to, to, to deliver that kind of uh, component. That's it. So we're not doing anything more than that. And so immediately we're able to uh, figure out exactly what the, the magnitude of the velocity might be. So that's one of the, the motivations, I guess, we have in doing this. Okay? If we wanted to resolve uh, horizontally, we could. We could imagine having a force here that we have to um, restrain with. Um, in this particular case, the force that would have to hold it in place would be, uh, actually don't have to have any force here, we'd have uh, this incoming fluid, uh, yeah, let's, actually let's not do that because we don't really know what the pressure is that's coming in here, right? We don't know pressure one because not, it's not necessarily atmospheric, right? Because it's being fed by an umbilical. So it gets a bit more complex in the, the horizontal plane. So let's not, not go there. All right? So that's really all we're trying to do. We're trying to balance forces. And we need to take this expression here. We need to figure out which part of it we need in terms of resolving one of the directions. We have a scalar magnitude. We have a vectoral magnitude and a vectoral force. And we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that we have to have appropriate conventions to represent these. Out is positive, in is negative for mass flow rate, and the other ones take on the, the geometries of the system. Okay. I guess it's, it's actually in here, right? So I was going to switch back, and I think it's perhaps useful just to talk about, not go through the all the calculations, but just look at some examples and kind of set up the problem to be able to explain exactly how uh, we, we might do this. So this is uh, an example with um, flow around a bend. It goes in at some velocity. Uh, the, the, it comes out at some different velocity. We'd imagine it's a different velocity because it's a smaller uh, orifice. And therefore, as so long as we're not accumulating fluid in this part, then the flow rate that goes in here has to come out here. Q has to be the same, mass flow rate. And therefore, it has to be faster out here. Um, we would expect that this would have a fluid pressure attached to it because it's driving the flow. From the same arguments that we just had out uh, from the previous example, we would expect that the fluid pressure here would be atmospheric. And so the question might be, what kinds of forces do you have to hold this thing with to be able to stop it uh, shooting off in some direction? And so what you can do is you can draw yourself some provisional forces that you might want to hold it with. You can draw yourself a control volume, which is this data dashed line that goes around the outside. And you can consider the flows that go across that control surface. And we only have two places where there are flows that go across there. One is here, and the other one is here. And so uh, we're interested in, in this particular case in looking at least in the, the x direction. So let's look at conservation. It's really conservation of momentum in x. 
And so what would be the components that we deal with here? Well, we have a flow rate that's in to here. So this is the, the equivalent of the mass flow rate. So this would be, if you pre-multiply this by a density and post-multiply this by a density, this is a flow rate in. So the outer, so this is the control surface that you have here. The outer normal is my finger. The flow rate is in the opposite direction for that. And therefore, that's the reason for this negative sign here. If you look at the, this is the mass flow rate here, if we multiply it by also the area. So a velocity, a density, and an area is the mass flow rate. This, I guess this would have to be an area as well, right? Then this, by virtue of our sign convention, has to be negative. It's flowing into the system, perpendicular, op opposite, sorry, not perpendicular, opposite to, in, to the direction of the unit normal. And therefore, this has to be negative. But this velocity, forget this figure here, and remember this figure here. I think that's right. I thought I saw oh, no, there. Yes, right. This is the, the figure. X is positive, Y positive. So forget this. So this is in the positive X direction, but this is the negative. So this ends up being a, neg a net negative. Okay. The other component we have is this. The mass flow rate is out. So this is by definition positive. I won't write the other components in here. This has to be positive because it's coming out of the system. If you multiply it by the vectoral sign of this, which is in the negative x direction, then a positive times this magnitude here being negative gives you a negative. And so you just have to do the accounting. And so uh, if you look at this portion down here, it's where it's written out. So this is the, the component that goes in. So let me just make it a, a tad smaller. So this component here is the mass flow rate, m dot. Because it's into here, it has to be negative. This value, v1, they've switched these magnitudes here. I guess the, I think in the book they use u, v, and W, don't they, for velocities? So this is the velocity in the X direction, U. I think that's why they've changed it from this, this figure. And this is, uh, this value is positive, but because the mass flow rate is negative, this term is overall negative. Coming up here, the mass flow rate out of the system is positive. But this velocity here is in the negative x direction, and therefore it's negative. So you have to just do the accounting. So the sign convention for this is correct for this xy system. We've cut this off, and so in addition to this, we have acting on the edge of this control volume, this magnitude of pressure, not a velocity now. It's acting on this. So the pressure multiplied by the cross-sectional area of this flow is a force. The net force is in the positive x direction, and this is this term here. We could add another force on the other side if we wanted to, which would be P1 A1, but this is going to be atmospheric. And the only other term is that we're going to hold this with some force, F. We're going to define this force that we're holding this thing so it doesn't move. And so we have something that we're able to um, equate. We, have, we want to know what this is. Um, we know probably what U1 is, maybe, or U2. If we know both U1 and U2, we can solve this, because we, um, so long as we know what the pressure is within our system. 
and if not, we have to do something else. If we need to figure out exactly what our relationship, we said before that u1, a1 must be related to u2, a2 is our simplest way of being able to define continuity. So if we have only one of these, then we can also write mass flow rates as being these two. And if we substitute this into the expression, we're able to solve it. So I'm not, not going to work out through the, the, the solution, but we end up being able to figure out exactly what, if we know what the velocities are and the pressures are, we can calculate what the other remaining magnitude is. That's it. So it's just a matter of setting up the problem. So I guess what you have to remember is that the, the um, uh, sign conventions for mass flow rates, which must be positive out, negative in, the sign convention's velocities, which must be aligned with the global coordinates. And yeah, I guess that's it. Okay. So, so that's it. And so you can go through the rest of the, the example at your leisure, and you can find out what the, the magnitudes of the, the forces that are that you have to apply to be able to keep it in place. And it turns out to be equal to, to some magnitude of, of pounds. We can get a little more complicated if we want. Um, sometimes uh, we said that in most cases you, we could probably get away with velocity times mass flow rate is equal to force that's applied. In this particular case, it would be the velocity in y and the force in y. So if, if we're just resolving here. But this is a slightly, well, a bit more complicated example. But immediately you can see, so you have a sheet of water that comes out. So you have a, a flow that's going into this block. The flow goes round a corner and squirts out of the block for some reason at some distribution of velocities along a slit. You can imagine that if you have this held in place, that the water that squirts out of here thrusts it just like the jet lev, and you'd have to apply some force to stop it from moving. So the question, uh, well, I guess one observation is that if you look at this flow rate here, this flow rate has no influence on the magnitude of the force that's being applied. You can imagine all the pressures and forces that would be applied by this, they're all going to be orthogonal to this, and so we can neglect them. So there only really becomes one characteristic dimension that we're worried about in this particular case, that we have some flow rate in, by conservation of mass, we know exactly the same flow rate must come out. Uh, we're actually uh, uh, kind of given it, well, we're not given a flow rate, but we're given a velocity that comes out. And if we want to calculate the force that we have to apply, or calculate the force that we have to apply to keep it in one place, we just need to resolve in one direction. That's the y direction. In this particular case, we can't quite get away with this because we see that this velocity that comes out is not constant as we go along here. And so maybe we have to come back to think about the equation, which is in its raw form. Is this. So this is no different from this. This is the vector. We're only looking at one component. So this would be for three components. But we're only going to look for one of them. And this component here is the mass flow rate. A velocity times a density times an area. Right? That's our definition of mass flow rate. The dot product merely gives it the right sign because they're almost in all cases that we do, they'll be aligned either orthogonal or directly aligned. And so it's either 1, minus 1, or 0 is the dot product. And we can work out exactly what this is. So what do we need? We need a velocity. So we know that the velocity here is 10 meters per second. At x equals 0 0.2. So we're going to draw a coordinate system. Doesn't really matter how we do it. I guess the normal coordinate system we'd have, uh, in this particular case, this would be uh, x. This would be y, 
and this would be z. Not that it matters so much in terms of directions. And we know that v is also equal to 0 meters a second at x equals 0 meters. And so we could write an equation for this. Clearly, the velocity is 0 here, so it fits this. It's some constant multiplied by x. If we substitute the values for 0 into here, then we get v equals 0 at x equals 0, right? Just substituting x into here. And if we substitute 0.2 into this, 0.2 times 50 is 10. Zero point two meters. So just by observation, we could guess that the, the velocity would be this. So we know what the velocity is, but and we also know that the velocity is not constant. And so we could write out this expression as you see below, resolving only in the we're resolving in the y direction, although the velocity in y is defined in terms of an x coordinate. <coughs> And so we could try and write this, uh, this expression here in its discrete form. The force in the y direction actually would be, what would it be in this, this parlance? We're describing a force that acts in this direction. It's in the negative y. So this, you could imagine, should be minus uh, if we're true to our components. These are the magnitudes of the velocities, which we put into here. Rather than writing it as a mass flow rate, we could just gather these two terms here for velocity, take the density outside because density is not changing, and we can write this area in terms of the area is equal to what? It equal to the height of this slit, whatever that is. is equal to the height of the slit multiplied by a small unit length. So if you drew that out, this would be what the slit would look like here, a portion of it. It would be this height, you can't draw very finely, which would be h. And this length here would be dx. And this would be the area out of which fluid comes as we go along here. So this is just this area. We know the value of Vx, so it's just um, 50 squared times x squared, if I move this up a little bit. So in other words, if we just put into here that V squared is going to be equal to what? 50x, all squared, this is here, and we do the integration. 50 squared is a constant, uh, x ends up being x squared. We have a dx, so the only component, I guess, we're, we're trying to integrate. We're trying to integrate x squared dx. All the other terms end up being constant. h is a constant, 50 squared is a constant, and if we do that, we end up getting the pens has a, a, a delay on it for some reason. Evaluated between the limits of x equals 0 and x equals uh, 0 0.2. And that's what this is. And so all it is is instead of taking the mass flow rate is constant. It's really dividing up, up into a velocity. And if you end up doing the integration, etc., we, we know everything in this expression. We know the height. We know the limits for x, which we're evaluating this between. And so we have everything to plug into this equation to calculate exactly what the, the force is that's applied. Um, in terms of did we have to be careful with our velocities in this particular case? I don't think so, right? Um, the velocity out of here, so this dot product would be positive because it's out. Um, I guess, actually, yeah. Actually, it's a negative, right? So this is a positive. If we wanted to be very strict with our sign convention, 
let me get this on and look at the signs. The dot product of velocity times the normal two have to be positive because it's coming out of here. So this term here would be positive. But this term here, because our y direction is in the opposite direction, this would be a negative velocity. So there should be a negative sign here. And so that means that there would be a, a negative sign that would pervade here. But that's fine because the way we define our force is in this direction to hold it. And so this force is in the negative y direction. So this also has a negative attached to it as well. So these two negatives. So if we're very, being very strict with the sign convention, we'd end up canceling those. So basically this says that to hold this in place, we have to have a positive force of 66.6 .6 newtons. The positive direction is as we've defined here. And so you could imagine that if you have water squirting out of this hose, that you're going to have to push against, against it as it comes out of the hose to hold it st static. And so maybe, hopefully, it makes, makes sense in terms of uh, our physical understanding of this. Right? So uh, just a different way to, to be able to do it. Maybe a more complicated, uh, yeah, maybe more complicated than we, we want to, to deal with. Uh, actually, no, let's not do that. I'm tired of, tired of doing examples. Let's uh, talk a little bit about, and maybe we'll do enough to be able to introduce the problem today, but uh, finish it up on Friday. I don't know what this is. Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Well, we saw it already once. So say we wanted to be able to solve uh, a slightly different problem. So the problem we looked at first off today was this problem of a, a decapitated um, a gas, gas bottle, gas tank. And so the idea was that you can clamp this with a force that we can apply to this. If nothing's happening and it's just sitting on the ground, as indeed this was, then you can imagine there's no flows out of the system, so we don't have to worry about that being any kind of force whatsoever. If we take off the top of this bottle so that there's some flow velocity over some cross-sectional area of this pipe, then if we use our force balance, that is velocity 1 multiplied by mass flow rate 1 equals force, say, in the x direction, then what do we have? We have a mass flow rate, and what will that mass flow rate be? Will it be positive or negative? Yeah, positive. Out. Out is positive. It'll have some velocity, positive or negative. And of course, this has to equal V1, A1 times density, whatever the density is of the gas. And so in this particular case, uh, we could attempt to be able to figure out exactly what the force would be applied, if that's the case. So in other words, we could be able to, to do this. And that comes out to be satisfactory. But the other question we might like to ask ourselves is what happens if this is potentially moving? What happens if we put the force? So in other words, if we know the velocities and the mass flow rates are coming out of here, we could calculate the force that we have to apply to be able to anchor that. In this particular case, it's going to turn out that this force is positive, as it should be, to, to anchor it, to push against it. You can imagine 
unfortunately getting hit in the chest by this bottle. It would put a force on you, your body reaction would be against it, and so you'd imagine that this would be a positive force as well. So the sign convention for this works out. The other thing that we could also do is that we could choose, even if this is kicking out gas, to make this force equal to zero, so we're not holding it. If we're not holding it, then we'd expect also that this control volume would move at some velocity of the control volume. And so we went to some um, length before to make the point that we could write in terms of, what was our equation? V static is equal to W plus the velocity of the control surface. Right? We talked about substantial derivatives. And so this is us standing on the key, watching the fire boat go past. This is the velocity of the jet coming out of the fire boat as the guy or gal standing on the deck sees it. And this is the velocity that the fire boat's traveling at. These are actually vectors. They have three components, x, y, and z. We talk, thought about it in terms of one. And so what we could do is we could try putting this expression into Reynolds transport theorem. And I'm, I'm not sure I really want to do the, the, the derivation uh, other than to get maybe to the, the punchline. The punchline is that if we have a, a, a control volume that happens to be moving, then we can use this relationship here directly to substitute into Reynolds transport theorem. And if we do that, we get this expression here. So no, I'll, I won't move that. So in other words, we want to use this concept. We realize that this is the velocity relative to a static observer. That's the coordinate system that we need to do these calculations in. And so, if we take Reynolds transport theorem, and instead of writing it as we did before as mass flow rate is equal to sum of forces multiplied by velocity. This is what we had before, right? We take this static component here and we substitute in this expression we had down here. I'm just going to do it. So Then we can show that the expression that we should get if we write it out in our wrong longhand is that we want the sum of W plus velocity of the control surfaces multiplied by mass flow rate is equal to the sum of forces. So this expression here, if I corral it off, is no different to what you have at the top of this page, right? The one that we've been using all day today. It differs only in the fact that this, these two terms, well, this, this term here, is defined in terms of now an extra component, which is allowing for the fact that our control volume can actually move. And so all of the examples that we've done today, we could do with this expression because the velocity of our control volume is actually equal to zero. And so we can just throw this, this term away. But when we want to talk about moving things, like this gas bottle flowing firing through the air, then we want to be able to, to use this term slightly different. So, so that, that's exactly this. And so we don't have enough time to really go through an example, but if you're interested, um, look through this explanation here. This is exactly the, 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 the same description, and we'll talk about that the, the gas bottle example next time. So we'll carry on with this idea to calculate the question is, what is velocity times control surface?